Welcome everyone to Digital Support for Caregivers. My name is Ashika and I'm a volunteer with the Dementia Society. This workshop is designed mainly for caregivers and hosted by Con Connected Canadians and the Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew County. Tonight, uh, today you will learn ways to use digital technology to organize schedules with digital calendars, deliver care, and connect virtually with medical professionals using tools like Care Team. Our speaker today is Jesse Smith, uh, Technology Mentor, Accessibility, and Dementia Lead for Connected Canadians. If you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, so with all that being said, I will hand it over to Jesse. Thank you for that, Ishika. And hello to everyone that's joining us both uh, in the, the Zoom webinar through Eventbrite and also on Facebook right now. It's good to be talking with you and hopefully will be good for you to be learning something over this next hour. As Ishika said, I'm with an organization called Connected Canadians. So we're a nonprofit that, uh, that works across Canada, although our base of operations is in Ottawa. And we provide free support uh, in order to promote digital literacy for older Canadians. And along with our work doing one-on-one -on -one support, we offer a variety of programming to organizations and individuals who are looking to increase their skills, either with regards to digital literacy and how that can be acquired and how it might need to change as you age. And also we work with people who care for the elderly, people who uh, work in long-term care homes, people who have family members who are experiencing um, the effects of aging, whether that be along a, a normal course of aging or one that is also dealing with the effects of dementia or other forms of progressive degenerative diseases. And so it's, it's great to be talking tonight, although I'm sure many of you wish that these were not subjects that you had to cover. I want you to know that, that they can uh, enrich your life and the, the lives of those who you're helping and make your time as caregivers both more productive and I would say enjoyable. So as we go through this, I'm going to be sharing my screen in this presentation. But again, if you have any questions, just put those up either in you, know, you can put those, uh, you can ask those questions via Facebook, you can ask the questions via the, the Q&A window. And as we go, I just want to start off, one moment, oh, sorry about that. It slipped out of presentation mode. We're gonna bring that back. So there, there's really three, three prongs or three ways that we're going to approach our time together here this afternoon or this evening, depending where you are. What we're going to do in this session is help you to understand what actual tools are available to you and the person you're caring for. So those tools can be in the form of uh, assistive devices that, that are uh, more like hardware, but that are nevertheless a type of technology but also digital or software-based platforms or tools that you can use and trying to look at how you can use them. And it's important also for us to be able to, to name and understand what technology can do for you as much as what it can't do. So with that said, I do want to just show you the, the experience of what it can look like to learn and to, to feel the way in which Techno in which digital literacy skills can improve the experience of someone. Th these are testimonials of people that we were helping mostly prior to the pandemic. So as you see people who are not socially distanced or are not wearing a mask, know that that's because this is footage from uh, just about this time a year ago, in fact. Uh, we have just recently celebrated three years of stories with our clients. But this was the video that we put together for when we hit the two-year milestone. Moment. I want to make sure that I'm sharing with sound here because it's great to be able to hear these people. Here we are. Thank you. 
Connected Canadians, connecting older adults with technology, training and support. Today I attended an event with Connected Canadians and they're an organization that helps to pair young tech savvy individuals with older adults like myself. And then I brought out my little phone and they showed me how to send a message, which I hadn't known how to do before, and take a picture. I'm going to ask you um, questions you know, about how your session went. Oh my gosh, I learned so much on my phone because now I know how to go on Facebook on my phone. I know how to uh, send pictures on my phone. Perfect. And I get so excited because it is not easy for a senior. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Really wonderful idea, especially it's free. <laughs> Perfect. We share what we know. You learn from us and we can learn from you all the technical thing, the modernized world. It's helping you do things. I want to learn. I want to keep learning. Perfect. We, uh, we set up your, your email today as well, right? Email. Emails and send in pictures. Oh, and send yeah. talk on it. There's all that fun aspect and it helps you connect with people. When you come here, you learn more and and everyone is so nice. Every time we give a workshop, we try to give a new idea or a new yes. topic. If I had my way, I would invite other people in the community to come in. And how would you say, it? get adapted to it. It's not only educational, it's fun. Twitter? Yes, those, those are some of the things that I learned. Today I learned uh, how to uh, use the Google. Especially f for getting blind people familiar with uh, Android phones. This is definitely filling a niche. FaceTime. Right. Uh, our family is distributed from a communications point of view. Uh, it used to be Skype, now it seems to be FaceTime. And there's games to keep you, uh, keep that memory going. Do you learn new skills like when you use your devices? I press on a button on my hearing aids and I can hear the TV, but sometimes it's too loud. And then I adjust it with this, with my iPhone. <laughs> Perfect, that's fantastic. Now I have a better idea of how it works and why we're having problems. Oh, well, the main difference is that the volunteers are helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, that's fantastic. I did get help. I had more help than I can probably remember today. Yes, we, we have to connect. We need it now because that's the way the world's going. I wish that everybody had access to something like this, you know because we, we do really want to learn. They can always stay connected and to fight isolation and to always kind of like learn new skills on technology. So this is something that we strongly believe that. So that's just a bit of who we are and what we've done. And I, I hope that you can also get from that what it's like, what it feels like when technology works for you. But it's true that technology doesn't always feel like it's working for you. So what, what we were talking about there, a lot of those people had just received one-on-one -on -one support or we spoke with them after group workshops, workshops just like this that used to happen in person but that now happen online. And sometimes there are things that we admit we can't answer fully. And so it's good to know that in cases where uh, knowledge that might be that you might require is very specific, that that information is something that even if we don't have, we know how to point people to it. And sometimes we can also help you figure out just what tools work best for you. It could be that the person who you are supporting currently has relatively high level motor abilities so that they're able to get around the house or the apartment quite well, but they have great difficulty with things outside of the home. And so the technology needs or supports that you might need are different from someone whose experience with dementia uh, really affects their, their long-term memory in particular or, or their short-term memory. So for it may be less to do with um, with mobility or outside of the house activities, but actually setting reminders, having things that, that pop up as alerts and things that are more like scheduling. So knowing what you need, it determines what kinds of supports can work for you.
And we are very good at knowing what those supports should be given your context. Now, there are some things that, that we don't do. We do not offer right now in-person device support. That was something that had happened in some cases like drop-in centers almost, where we would offer support or advice uh, for a particular residence or a particular building. But given the restrictions uh, in that were created by the pandemic, that's not something we're able to do right now. And it's also true that we are not able to act as a go-between for you and healthcare providers. So if you have found out that you need to, to set up uh, a Zoom meeting with a doctor, that would not be something that we would set up on your behalf. But what we would do is love to teach you how to acquire that skill set for yourself. Because th that's really what our goal is for everyone who we help. We want people to become more technologically confident and technologically competent. The two go together. And sometimes the kinds of things that you're able to do are just as much because of the confidence you have as your actual know-how. You know, if, if your main experience with computers ended 10, 15, however many years ago, there could, there could have been a real time where you were worried, oh, if I do something wrong, I press the wrong keys, I do this or that, I'm gonna break something. You can't really break things anymore in the same way. I mean, obviously, if you throw a tablet on the ground, it's gonna crack the screen. But you used to live in fear of these things called blue screens of death on a computer where things went so fatally wrong that it could be the computer was totally ruined. That doesn't really happen anymore. Or if it does, you see it coming a mile away. It's true though, that the fear or lack of confidence that we have in our own abilities, even just to, to say to ourselves, well, if I, if I click this, what happens? If I press that, what if I try this or that? Poke at the buttons almost. You know, sometimes you can figure things out that way and with remarkable, consistency and have a great success rate. But if you don't have the confidence to even try and experiment, you'll never get that far. And so what we want to do as we encourage digital, digital literacy is both of the both forms of support. Now, with that said, we talked about how the, there are three ways that, that we want to, to help you consider how you can use technology to make your lives as caregivers better. And in making your own caregiving work better, you then make the life of the person you're caring for better. One of the most difficult things to, to fully grasp um, when you're caring for anyone else is time management because it's hard enough for you to keep your own schedule straight. That when you are all of a sudden tasked with remembering and monitoring the routines of another person who often is not fully able to remember that schedule themselves, that's really tough. And so one of the great things about using digital calendars or forms of software that um, that track time or manage time is that you can keep track of these things and also share your, share your itinerary, share a lot of your scheduling with other people. Now you can do that in limited ways with the standard calendar programs that are on just about any device that you would have. If you're using a Microsoft device, there is in fact a task organizer called Microsoft To Do that works almost like a, it's better than sticky notes. It's like a checklist program that lets you, that lets you create lists of tasks you want to do on a particular day and then lets you assess how many th that you've finished. But also it lets you schedule tasks for the future and then share those tasks with other people. So to do lets you do that in, in a very simple, streamlined way. You can also use the calendar functions or the calendar applications on Apple products to do the same thing. 
So the Apple Calendar app uh, allows you to schedule things. And once you've scheduled things, you can do other actions like invite people. You know, a lot of you probably received an email from Eventbrite for this evening that invited you to this session. And you might have noticed that if you clicked on this um, on the invitation link, maybe it got added to your calendar already. Well, I want you to know that's not something that just high tech companies can do. That's not some special ability that Eventbrite has. You can actually create scheduled events in your calendars and then invite other people. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important if you have multiple people, let's say, who are needing to be kept apprised of what's going on. So let's say you and all of your siblings are going to be at a certain place for one of your parents or need to be there. Well, you can invite multiple individuals to a calendar event. And something like that is possible through the applications that are already on your devices. If you have a Microsoft, um, if you're running Microsoft Windows or if you're on an Apple computer. And it's also true that if you don't have either of those things, let's say the only thing you have is a smartphone or maybe somebody bought you a Chromebook once and you don't really know what that means and how that's different from Windows, but you kind of know it uses Google for stuff. Well, Google has a calendar app too. So <laughs> there's no excuses. If you've got a device that's got enough juice to connect to this Zoom meeting, you've got enough uh, of a computer, whether that's a handheld one or a traditional uh, desktop or laptop, you've got enough computing power to run a calendar that can let you schedule these things. And what that does is allow you to understand and see your time or even the time of others. Because Another thing that you can do with these calendars, and this is especially true and useful of the Google Calendar that can be uh, attached to a Gmail account. You yourself create a calendar, but other people can create their calendars and then make them visible to you. That is a huge, huge time saver. Let's say you and your brother both have busy lives. And you never know, okay, so can you get mom next week on Tuesday and I'll get her the Tuesday after that? Wait, but you have this thing uh, that, that when you can hear already how confusing that gets, imagine what it would look like, how many fewer conversations you would need to have if you could have your schedule written out and he could have his written out. And before you ask the question, you look at his calendar. Before he looks at your question, he looks at yours. And that can be done, that can be shared easily if you know how to do it. And if you don't know how to do it, that's the kind of thing that Connected Canadians can help you learn to do better. So it's also true that beyond just the actual time management, you know, if you need to take someone to an appointment, um, there's a good chance that appointment is with a healthcare provider. And when it comes to the provision of healthcare or other types of services, there exists uh, several platforms, several ways that you can use these programs to better help the person you're caring for. One great example of this is a program that was designed in Canada. It was uh, originally created in British Columbia called Care Team. And what Care Team allows you to do is coordinate care in between multiple individuals and multiple care providers. Because when you're helping someone with dementia, there is, there is a whole range of people that you need, that I mean, you either know this already or you are learning this as you go. You know, the, the way that you need to be in touch with an occupational therapist to do a functional skills assessment and the way you need to be talking to a pharmacist to understand the changing of medication doses and the way you need to be talking to a doctor and the way you need to be talking to somebody that's perhaps a specialist for the particular form of dementia that the person you're caring for is experiencing. And then you have the people that are driving to appointments and then you have the meals that are coming and there's 
it goes on and on. And how can you possibly keep all of these things straight? Well, you can keep those things straight with care team. And that's one of the reasons why it exists. Because not only does it let you speak with multiple healthcare professionals at multiple levels, it also lets you control the amount of information or responsibility that each of those providers or partners has. So it could be that there is a neighbor who has agreed to drive your mother to a particular doctor's appointment, but you don't want that neighbor to log into care team to find out when the appointments are or what the name of the doctor is and have them see their entire, your mom's entire medical history. What care team lets you do is build, um, build layers of connections and layers of privacy into the way that you coordinate and navigate the entire program of supports and, and all the coordinations required to care for somebody who's living with dementia. So it's, it's a hugely powerful program. That does also mean it can be hugely intimidating because there's so many, what, I mean, <laughs> I didn't think we'd be talking about Spider-Man tonight, but it, it's true in more places than you think that with great power comes great responsibility. And this is an example of that, where the amount of information and actual uh, sort of software power in care team is really big. So that means it takes sometimes a lot of work to, to get it smoothed out. Now, it could be that you're caring for someone um, that may be eventually on their way to an assisted living facility of some form. It could be that you are looking for at-home care support or support workers. And regardless of which of those options you're considering right now, there is a chance that some type of support device or support program will be used by the people who are helping uh, the people you're caring for. Uh, the icon you see there, the professional caregiver tools is the, the symbol for something called Oscar Senior. And it, more and more you might begin seeing also Oscar Family as an option, which is sort of a, a similar program that's designed for uh, families to, to connect. But Oscar Senior is designed for caregivers, maybe a one PSW who supports multiple clients in their own homes. It allows them to connect remotely and, um, and do things like confirm that medication gets taken or uh, access assistive devices like fall monitors that the person might be wearing. So this is a, a program that is used by professional caregivers that is now because of the way that uh, elders, elder care has become very different because of COVID-19, this is actually changing to be something that is applicable and usable by families as well. So this is less about the coordination of care, like care team, and more about a direct support. Think about it as, as like a, a program that has a, a simplified version of Zoom put into it so you can do, or even like a FaceTime thing. So you can make a, you can make in one program a call, a video call to check in, to check on the meds and then get some other information like, um, you know, the, the program can show, can be connected to a, a smart thermostat in the person's house or apartment. Because, you know, I was actually just speaking with someone today whose parents had dementia and right before they went into care, one of the things that, that happened that, that he was shocked by was when he was in Toronto, he started getting power bills for three, four times the amount that, that he had ever gotten before. And that's because his parents would turn the temperature up to 28 degrees every day because in the morning they would wake up and turn it way, way up and not think to turn it down again. Because for them, they, you only turn off the power at night. Now with something like Oscar Senior that also incorporates a thermostat into the program, you would catch something like that and be able to have a conversation. So there's, there's lots of little things that can be involved in uh, a type of caregiving tool that you might not think about or that might not even be possible without a face-to-face -face visit or couldn't have been possible um, just a few years ago. You know, it's one thing to be able to talk on the phone to your brother, your sister, your mom, or your dad, whoever it is who is experiencing 
dementia, but it's another thing to be able to get bits of information like that, you know, real quality of life things that can be communicated via uh, technological means. Now, these, these are sort of assistive tools, ways that, that you either can help coordinate or help actually access the person you're caring for. But when it comes to medical professionals who you will need to talk to, there are in fact ways to make connections directly. And sometimes those connections are over Zoom. They could be happening the same way that you and I are talking. I, I have yet to encounter a doctor who holds uh, you know, house calls via Facebook Live, but I don't know, maybe they're out there. I, I suspect though they would value something that has a bit more privacy and a bit more security, which is one of the reasons why Zoom sometimes is viewed with suspicion as a way for um, communicating. Uh, my sister is actually an occupational therapist, and she works with several uh, doctors who actually do not use Zoom because of the concerns they have over safety. Now, I might quibble over whether that's a real thing or not, but what I will say is that in the space created by those security concerns, there are really great telemedicine platforms designed specifically for communication with health professionals, either people who you are already having uh, appointments with, or perhaps as a way to access new services. So uh, for example, there is a program called Doxy that gives one-on-one -on -one video access that incorporates some other forms of smart device integration that is used by several doctor's offices in and around Ottawa. And that could be something that you might have to set up. You might wonder, well, how can I, do I have to pay for this? And in general, you don't. Sometimes the, the phrase telemedicine can be confusing because when it gets used, uh, it can refer sometimes to the delivery mechanism and sometimes to a whole new product. Uh, if I could give one example, there is actually a telemedicine company called Maple um, that is relatively new to the scene in Canada, but that itself offers appointments with doctors to discuss simple issues. Maybe it's refilling a prescription. Um, maybe it's to address an issue or a, I've even, I, I heard about this because someone I know needed a referral to a lactation consultant. They were, a, they were a new mom, but they have more services, but they're themselves connecting you to doctors and acting like as a middleman that um, they usually collect fees in this case. But Doxy is a program and other doctors use programs like this where they are not there to charge you money. They are there to facilitate remote connections with people you already have an established connection with. And so that can be tricky because maybe you've been put in touch with a particular specialist, but they're a few hours away. And so you need to be, meet remotely, but you've never done, uh, like you, maybe you're watching right now on Facebook Live, but you don't have a web camera or you have a web camera on your computer, but you've never used it. And you're worried because now you need to have an appointment with someone using this service where they need to see me and I need to see them. And if you've never done that before, that can be overwhelming. And I'll say again, that's exactly the sort of thing that Connected Canadians helps with. So we don't only teach about how these services work, but if you don't have any clue how to take even the first step, we do. So some, someone is there. Now, all of these things sound sort of very theoretical, very broad, and perhaps uh, perhaps I've been losing you a little bit just in words, but I wanna show you here a screen, a screen that shows you one of these platforms. So this is actually Care Team. I, I mentioned a few different programs now, but remember the first one is about how to coordinate care. And Care Team is a program that is used by the Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew County uh, they're able to recommend, and we at Connected Canadians are able to help you understand how this works better. 
But look, what I have here is the example, the, the Mary Doe profile. So this is to show you what it would look like to have a profile created for someone. And in this case, it's got a medical insurance number here. So I'm showing you one of the views that has much more privileged information shown. But if you look up at the top, you can see that there's ways that you can look at the activity feed. So that would show you all the different actions that other people have taken, the tasks that need to happen, resources that are available, and then the team. Well, what do some of these things mean? Well, let's say, let's say that you had um, had a doctor that was part of Mary's service team, and they scheduled an appointment. If they were to use Care Team to to notify you of that appointment. Not only would you be notified that this appointment was scheduled, but everyone else on the team that had the right privileges would know. So let's say that, the, that part of the team is you and your two siblings. When this appointment gets scheduled, all three of you would get notifications that that was there. But maybe there's another person. Maybe there's, um, maybe there's someone who actually walks the dogs while Mary is at the doctor's office, but the walks can only happen while Mary's out of the house because Mary gets a little concerned when she sees somebody walking away with her dogs because she doesn't understand that they'll be back in an hour. So the dog walker could log into their less privileged profile and they might get an activity feed that says, Mary has an appointment. And so then they know that's a great time to walk the dogs. They don't need to know sort of the, the exact the things that are requested for this medical appointment. They don't need to know her insurance number, but what that person could do by logging into the activity feed, they could see these things. And maybe that's a task on the list that they can check off. Tick, the dog was walked the week of March the 1st. So they would see in their feed this simple thing there's a task that is recurring every week that you set up because you love Mary and you want her dog to get walked every week. So the dog walker can tick off that task and then it's not on anybody's list. You don't have to see that anymore. So can you, I hope you can hear how so much of this could sound confusing, but you know, before you learn to drive a car, the idea of all those moving parts were really confusing. Before you ever balanced a checkbook, before you ever filed your taxes, that all seemed really confusing. Now, sometimes you might've said, and it's still confusing, so I pay somebody else to do my taxes. Or you could have been the kind of person that says, well, it's confusing, but let's make sense of this. And I want to assure you that while Care Team may have many moving parts, if you want to, it is the kind of thing that you can very much make sense of. And once you've done that, it will make you feel empowered because not only of the level of control you have over the care plan of Mary or whoever, but also the type of knowledge that is at your fingertips. You know, when, when one of the doctors can upload resources and you can see these things in you don't have to read brochures in a doctor's waiting room anymore. You can find links to videos or some of the, the best, most up-to-date information that could be put up by a doctor. Uh, these things could all happen in one place. So, I mean, there's ways that you could even uh, simply add an appointment. There, there's ways that you can... <clears throat> Uh, even speak to like have messaging uh, with each other. So up in the top right, like you can you can chat with other people. Uh, maybe even leave a message for a doctor. Think of it almost like um, having as much functionality as like a social media platform. Like think of all the different things that you can do. Let's say when you're on Facebook, when you're on Twitter. Oh, there's there's you share pictures. You share videos, you watch things, you read articles, you talk to people, you talk to people in public, you talk to people in private. Like all of these things can happen. But imagine being able to do all of those things with a dedicated team 
that is responsible for Mary's well-being and knowing that all of that can happen even when each of you are distanced with, from each other. So it doesn't just need to be, uh, you know, a 10 person bubble, a single household that is able to see or talk to the person. You can really incorporate more people this way. And so that's one of the biggest benefits of using digital health supports and in general. And as you see here, those are some of the real strengths of using something like care team. Now, these are ways that you can use um, technology to sort of manage the care or help support, coordinate, and actually access health services. But it's also true that you yourself are just going to use technology. And so probably is the person that you're caring for. You know, they may still want to do things. They still might like listening to music and for them, the easiest way to do that had always been um, watching m music on YouTube. And you say, dad, YouTube's for videos, not music. And he says, yeah, but I can find it here. I know this, I get it. Okay, sure, watch music on YouTube, that's fine. But then what happens when it becomes difficult for him to see buttons or find his way around the screen? Well. It's true that there are a variety of touch controls that compensate for unsteady movement. It, sometimes, even if a person's hands don't work very well, it could be that using a, a voice assistant can, can be helpful. Now, it's also true that voice assistants can, for some people, be very jarring. Because if you're saying, hey, Google, find me a new show, or hey, Alexa, I want to uh, get me a recipe for banana bread. It, it can be unnerving at times to hear somebody speak back. Um, so I would say that using something like a voice assistant should only happen, it, it should only be sort of introduced to people that were already relatively comfortable to technology beforehand, but maybe didn't want to take that step. Or maybe it's something that, um, that you, they only use while you are present. Um, that's something that is admittedly more of a personal decision, but for those whose particular expression or, or um, form of dementia uh, is more focused on um, motor control. So I'm thinking maybe of somebody who is experiencing dementia that's itself because of a previous diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And so the symptoms of Parkinson's are having a greater impact on their quality of life than the cognitive decline at a particular point. For people in a situation like that, perhaps a voice assistant could be a great um, tool for a period of time. Smart devices are at times also useful. Uh, and sometimes this can be because of how you can control them via wireless network at times when perhaps the person you're caring for is unable to. So for something like that, I'm thinking of things like lights that are connected to, like that are integrated within a wireless network that perhaps you can turn off uh, if they forget to. Similarly with thermostats, uh, if, the, if the temperature in a room seems unusually low, you know, if somebody forgets to, to turn up the heat and you realize that, that it's creeping down, so it's only 10 degrees in their bedroom, in February. Well, that's not normal or shouldn't be normal. And so you can adjust that with some smart thermostats. Things like that are, are a great way that, that gives some of the, the support and autonomy to the person living with dementia while also allowing for a certain degree of oversight on your part. So those smart devices can be really useful. Sometimes there's also purpose-built technology that is there to assist and support people with dementia. I'm thinking of very simplified radios. I'm thinking of um, like alarm tags that let you from a centralized point locate devices that are uh, perhaps forgotten. You know, things that you can stick to uh, uh, a remote. Oftentimes they look like keychains or whatnot. Now those are actual devices, but there are things that you can do to existing devices 
that are also really useful. So you can use change uh, some touch controls, like the settings that are like sensitivity settings on devices. You can also um, <clears throat> use some things that in my experience, change some of the visual settings so that quick transitions aren't, uh, aren't as jarring. And you can use a variety of actual tools. So not only settings that can be changed to be more friendly for you and dementia sufferers, but programs like Zoom, like Skype, like Facebook and Messenger. And knowing which one of these is right for you is something that is sometimes trial and error. Sometimes it's asking people with more experience. Um, like one of the things that's notable about a program like Skype is that you make a video call where somebody actually gets a ring on the other side. And so that connection, that idea that, oh, we're going to call you, but it's going to be a video call, at least their device rings. So that familiarity can be useful. It could be though that the sound of a telephone ringing uh, might make them panic. And so maybe the idea of clicking on a link with Zoom um, is less stressful. And so that is something to consider as you try to determine how you want to communicate with someone um, as they are going through their experience of dementia. Now, to do all of this stuff, what do you need? Well, there's, there's a few things obviously that I suspect you already have. Like you need to have a, a modem or a router to be able to connect to the internet. And you also need to have some sort of digital device. You, like it can be a computer, it can be a tablet. In fairness, um, most smartphones now, like mobile phones are also themselves mini computers. <laughs> And they cost as much as computers too, if not more. Um, and sometimes you actually need the assistive devices. I will say though, that sometimes like if, if you are someone that is generally tech savvy or you have one person that is, I am surprised to see just how often devices that exist for the broader public often are useful for those experiencing dementia. And what I have here on screen is a prime example. What you see there, that picture of the, the five little key chains that say A, B, C, D, E, those are actually re um, remote alarm things that, as I was describing earlier, they help you find things if you lose them. And so this was, uh, this photo is a, a bit dated uh, that was a great innovation in the 1990s and still has uses today because that system can be used anywhere. You know, that doesn't require an internet connection, that, that doesn't require anything fancy, um, and it's fairly uniform. But it's also true that it can be kind of cumbersome because when you look at that, you say, well, how do I put one of those on a remote control? You know, th th there, there's no little thing I can't attach it really. Um, how do I stick one of those in a wallet without having a big jangly thing in my pocket? Whatever it might be, there, there exists now for the general public, a whole host of devices like this that allow you to find things that are lost. Um, I am myself admittedly uh, notoriously absent-minded and I will tell you from the bottom of my heart, the best present that my wife ever got me was something called a tile. And a tile is, is um, a little Bluetooth enabled device that you can slip in just about anything that works just like this purpose-built assistive technology. But because the market is understandably larger, I mean, there, there are over 400,000 people experiencing dementia in Canada, but I'd say there's probably over 4 million really absent-minded people um, so the market's larger and so more people get interested in those things. But the application of a tile is, um, is such that not only does it beep and let you find something around the house like this does using an app on your phone, if you lose something outside, it remembers, so this app, Tile, remembers the last place your device was seen. So the last time your phone sort of picked up and said, hey, it's over here, it's over there. So if they went wandering outside, 
um, and you don't know which way they went, you can use that app not only to, to walk outside and perhaps like hold it in the air and listen for the blip, 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 but it will tell you where the Bluetooth device went. So that's something that is not maybe the connection that you yourself would make. If you're not the tech savvy person, you would go directly to, you know, a dementia, uh, like store that's offering purpose built assistive devices and perhaps not consider how something that's designed for the general market is actually really useful, maybe even more useful for your particular context. So these things could be what you need, even if you don't know it. And that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, not just your tech savvy nephew or niece, but we at Connected Canadians love to help people with. Now, one final thing before I open up to, to questions, um, I was describing something, a tile device that required a smartphone. It's true when you're considering technology that a lot of the words that you'll see could be confusing to you. Sometimes you'll see things described as apps. Sometimes you'll hear about the cloud and offline programs too. One of the reasons this makes a big difference is that applications live on devices. So these are programs that might be on your phone, might be on a computer, um, but some, they, some apps require a connection to the internet, others don't. Programs that are cloud hosted, and so this actually refers to like Care Team, that's a cloud-based program. Um, that means that it is something that keeps the, the bulk of its digital footprint off of your computer. So the program itself, the whole network is hosted on a variety of servers on in some external location. That means you do need an internet connection to access that service. Whereas offline programs, and this could include something like the calendar apps that I was describing, those calendar apps exist on your computer completely. And so that means that you do not need an internet connection in order to access those. So these are important considerations, not only for yourself, you know, how reliable is your internet connection? Is the place where the person you're caring for a place that has an internet connection? Um, are some of the people I want to rope in to help or that are part of the support network, do they have internet connections? These are things to actually consider and words that should make you sort of Note a little flag are when you see things that are described as cloud-based services or if they're offline programs. So the, there, are, there are pros and cons to these. Obviously, you can do more with the things that are cloud-based, but the trade-off is that you need that internet access to get them. So just finally, I do want to say there are a few limitations. I, I've been very hopeful to what I have described here. Uh, and that's because I think that there are a lot of tools that each one of you can use really well. Maybe some of you are already using some tools really well. But it's also true that technology cannot actually replace human interactions. When they're the only thing that's possible, they can be great. I will still take a Zoom call over um, the quiet of loneliness any day. But I still wish that I could hug more people. I still wish that I could see people face to face. However, the mediation that's allowed, you know, like sometimes this is a, sometimes it's a good thing to have anything at all. You know, it's also true that technology and what I've been describing helps you manage the cognitive decline or at least the decline in cognitive ability of people, but it's not there to reverse it. And, and so there is still a continuum of, uh, of dementia that requires modification, not only of the assistive technologies used, but of the expectations that you have from them. That's a reality that's important to note. It's also true that technology can take effort to learn. Like if you're not already a natural at this, you have to make a certain calculation to figure out whether you would rather take the time to learn something and then have everything else be easier and run smoother. Or if your own system uh, currently, you know, doing it the pen and paper way is just easier than the hassle of learning. 
And making that conscious decision at the beginning will make your learning much more effective and rewarding. If you know why you're doing it, or you know why that you made the conscious decision to not bother, that's a good thing to reflect on before you start, not at the end when you sort of reflect after. And it's also true that technology can be expensive. So I don't want to just throw all of these ideas out there and say, go get them all. Because um, you know, if money was no issue, then we would be having very different conversations about just about everything in the world. But money is an issue. And so I want to recognize that. And, um, and with that, I do want to take some time just at the end um, to now, oh, I have two screens open. So sometimes my mouse gets really lost, like all over the place. But I wanted to take some time to get any reflections or questions from those of you who've been attending or watching on the, the Facebook Live to, to see if anything that I said provoked either a question or maybe inspired you to consider a particular form of technological device or software or assistive technology to maybe increase the capability of or enhance the efficiency of the care you're already giving right now for someone with dementia. So uh, I, I hope to hear from someone right now. Um, I haven't seen any questions on the chat or Q&A yet, but if you do have a question and haven't had a chance to ask it, um, I will be monitoring both the Facebook live chat and the Zoom chat. So um, you can put your questions in in either of those two places. And if there are no other questions, um, of course, I'll still be monitoring the chat. So while we're kind of making our uh, finishing statements, um, you can ask the question at any time and I'll um, stop talking and uh, say the question out loud. Um, but thank you, Jesse, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, oh, I think I just got a question. All right, so... Um, if there's nothing else, and we do have the three minutes, I wanted to make sure there was time for questions. There's just one other thing that, fortunately, on my side, I have to plug the Dementia Society. Um, and that's just that there is, in fact, one-on-one -on -one support that is offered, not just by Connected Canadians, but there are dementia care coaches that are part of the team at uh, DSORC. So they, they help you, they help caregivers, living with caregivers who are living with people with dementia, family members, and they, so that the society itself is able to provide dementia information, uh, referrals, and access to programs. These, this one-on-one -on -one support is also there to help you navigate the care system. If after having heard this, you think I would rather deal with a person right from the get-go, and we'll talk about care team later. That's a conversation that you can have and that the, the, the people at the society would love to have with you. And they also are there to help you develop strategies for self-management because as you're caring for another person, you also need to develop strategies for caring for yourself because that's going to happen in different ways now. So I would be remiss if I didn't say that. And also to say thank you to the society for giving us as uh, tech heads the chance to be able to speak with and share with all of you who are doing such great work as caregivers. Of course, thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you to everybody as well for tuning in. Um, this was hopefully a very helpful presentation. Um, and you can watch this webinar again um, if you want to look back and uh, see the contact information and things like that. Um, it will be available on our Facebook page and it will be available on the YouTube channel as well. Um, if you wish to learn more about connecting older adults with technology, training and support, you can also uh, visit uh, the website for uh, connectedcanadians.ca. And uh, I saw somebody in the chat also mentioned that they were uh, planning on checking out the website. So uh, that's 
also where you can get more information. Um, and like Jesse said, for more information on education programs and support, you can also visit our website, dementiahelp.ca. Um, and if you uh, want, you can also register to our weekly roundup. Um, so with all that being said, thank you and have a nice day, everyone. Bye.